Um, but really excited to have Desi Smelser here today to present on Bigfoot. She grew up in Humboldt County, California, in the Pacific Northwest, Bigfoot country. And she had experiences that influenced her, inspired her to go on and study anthropology, history, uh, and get a library science degree. Um, and so now she <laughs> presents on um, the history and culture of Bigfoot, including Native American Specifically, I'm talking about Native American stories um, and kind of go from there. Awesome. So please help me welcome Devin Green. Thank you, Desi. Uh, my real name is Desiree, but I go by Desi, like Desi or Nez. It's usually easier for patrons to remember. I am Matt's counterpart down in South Hadley. Uh, just so you know, my parents were deaf, so some of the experiences I had when I was younger was because uh, I'm pretty sure Bigfoot thought it was only hearing children and was confused. And when I was five years old, I had an experience, which I will talk about a little bit later, um, and it got me interested in anthropology. I wanted to understand what I saw. And that was the only way I could figure out, not necessarily science, because the science end of it I wasn't so much interested in as I knew there was oral traditions around this creature. And I was interested in that, which I will start to talk about briefly. For the majority of people, it is in the realm of cryptozoology. So it's something that is quote unquote unknown. But there's a lot of creatures out there that are being discovered. Um, the majority of the oceans are completely um, not even been explored yet. So we're going to be finding more creatures as time goes on. Um, so let's get started. So understanding, when I talk about the history and culture of Bigfoot, I'm specifically talking about Native American tradition and encounters that people have had prior to 1950. Okay? There is a lot of different names that what we call Bigfoot goes by. Sasquatch is the Salish word as a play on Salish word, which is the Klingit, um, which is up in the Pacific Northwest, Haida, et cetera, a uh, word for what we consider Bigfoot. So it's not regional. Um, there are encounters in all over the United States, except for Hawaii. Although Bigfoot have been known to be swimming, they don't swim that far. So it's just something to um, kind of keep in mind. The United States itself is very forested. About a third of the United States is forested. Not all of it is, um, has people there. Not all of it is someplace that humans have gone. Um, and I just think it's something to keep in mind. You see most of the Northeast, part of the South, and up into the Pacific Northwest. Where I'm from in Northern California, um, it's, most of California is forested, except when you get about halfway. Um, where I'm from, and this was the best picture I could find, um, I'm from Rio del Scotia area here. Um, the county itself is two and a half million acres, uh, but over half of it is actually covered in woods, and there are still parts of the woods that are so remote, people haven't been there in at least 100 years. Um, prior to that, it might have been beaver trap trappers that have gone into it, into different valleys. But there are big swaths of forested land that people just haven't seen. Um, when you look at the population, the population of Humboldt County is actually slightly less than the population of Franklin County, which I thought was kind of interesting. There's about 33 people per square mile. Whoop. So about 58% of the county is forested. Now the reason why I bring that up is it's typically Bigfoot seems to be found in forested areas. Um, and that's why I wanted to kind of just point that out. Massachusetts, 53% is forested. You can see where Quabbin is. <laughs> um, and a good chunk of it is devoted to forest, very specifically set aside for ecology, but also set aside um, for parkland that's in like cities, hence the, um, some of the uh, urban and rural parkland. So about three and a half million acres. So your, the county of Franklin is 464,000 acres, but if you sat down and you did the math, there's about 300 people per square mile. 
So compared to Humboldt, if you're standing in a square mile uh, and putting the amount of people that you would see, you're going to see people standing around in Franklin County in that square mile. Where in Humboldt, you might be able to yell really, really loud and hear someone yell back, but that's about it. So just you can kind of understand the remoteness of it. The size of the county I grew up in, Berkshire, it, it, the square compass essentially is Berkshire, Franklin, Hamden, Hampshire, and about half of Worcester County. So imagine that size <laughs> and then the population of only Franklin County. Okay, I'm just trying to get you to get an idea of just how remote kind of that area is. It's about five and a half to six hours north of San Francisco also. So if there's fog in Eureka, California, you got to drive up. Because you drive up, there's actually a lot more encounters because of the highway that goes up that's very remote. So that's something else, because we're driving up at like dusk, essentially, when we get there, um, or one or two in the morning to head down to San Francisco. So what's in a name? Um, some of the traditional names for Bigfoot, for the Algonquin tribe, the Oha means wild man, Hoopa, the Oma, boss of the woods, the other Hoopa uh, word, which I always have trouble pronouncing, but Wak, Pak, Kul, Ma. And it just means giant, so I would say Oma instead. <laughs> and most of them do too. Um, the Iroquois, um, it means, it's also, it means, so, Sinaqua is what I'm going to use for when I tell you a couple of the stories. It means stone giant. The Micmac is the Gugu. You've also heard some of the French call it the, uh, Ruguru is another word you've heard, which is a play actually on the Micmac that, that was originally found. And then the Yurok tribe, it's the Oma. Uh, it's believed the Yurok speak in Salish also, uh, but there's not very many Yurok left to actually um, kind of work on their language. Uh, my specialty for anthropology was actually languages, specifically looking at, at uh, sign language as ASL as a culture. So I'm interested in where these words came from. The part that amazed me, was out of the 57 tribes in North America, most of them have one or two words that deal specifically with what we would call Bigfoot or Sasquatch. None of the tribes either represent or talk about something that does not exist. All questions we'll do at the end, okay? Um, so that's something that um, I always thought was interesting. So when you see, for example, on the totem poles, you'll see Usually it's a female Bigfoot represented. She has these long breasts, and she usually, there's a, usually a basket that she'll stick on the back that she sticks bad kids in, and she'll walk away with them. <laughs> um, and she'll end up, they think they eat, that she eats them, um, but that's just the oral tradition around it. So I remember being a kid and my parents saying to me in sign language, be careful in the woods or the Bigfoot will eat you. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, I'll just stay here. <laughs> Work. It worked. It did work. <clears throat> so some of the Native American oral traditions from the Northeast, the Iroquois stone giant, um, these are some of the pictures I found from the Northeast Sasquatch Research Association. Um, this one's from the U.S. archives called My Uncle. And one of the stories, uh, the Genesequa, excuse me, the Genosequa is similar in folklore to the Wendigo. So the Wendigo is if a Indian became a cannibal, it would eat someone. It's usually during the dead of winter like this, where it's a bad winter, where winter keeps recurring and keeps coming up, and it turns into a Wendigo. Um, so the problem is with the Wendigo is there's no fullness attached to that eating. So once you eat, you want to eat more, and you want to eat more until you just become this savage beast. Um, so at the time, so their oral tradition is the Genosequa, or the stone coat giants, had run over the country. They fought a great battle and held people in subjugation for a long time. The stone giants were so ravenous that they devoured the people in almost every town in the country. The family separated from the others and went to the northwest. The stone giants decided to leave. The family was left to seek habituation and rules for humanity were forgotten. So they ate raw flesh of animals and they practiced rolling themselves in the sand. This meant that their bodies were covered in hard skin, and these people became giants and dreadful invaders of the country. They were the holder of the heavens, excuse me, the holder of the heavens led them into a deep ravine because he didn't like what he, they were doing. 
and it was near Ogundaga. And they rolled stones on top of them in the middle of the night, but one escaped. And since then, the stone coat giants left the country and sought asylum in regions to the further north. So that's their oral tradition about what we know as Bigfoot or Sasquatch. Um, the next one I'm going to talk about is the Micmac tribe, which is north of us. So if the stone giants went north, this is where they would have headed. The Micmac, they're known as, they call it the Chino, or the devil cannibal. Are we sensing a theme here? Um, the origin of the Chinu is when this great big witch was conquered by smaller witches that could kill the, the great witch, the giant witch, and turn him into a Chinu. He can fight, and they get ready to fight. They suddenly become really tall, and as tall as trees. Their weapons are the trees themselves that they would pull up out of the ground and throw at you or rip out. And they just had enormous great strength. The strength depends on the quantity or size of the piece of ice which lives in their heart. The little piece of ice looks like a full-figured human with hands and feet and a head and in every section of it's perfect. The female Chinu is even more powerful than the male Chinu. And they make a noise like a roaring lion, but is sharper and shriller and more frightful. And they live somewhere in the far, far cold north of northern Canada. I thought that was always interesting. Um, so I'm going to show you a little bit about where I grew up. And these are the th stories I heard growing up. Because in Humboldt County, once you've kind of had dinner and relaxed and you're chatting with friends and just kicking back, um, you talk about sometimes some of your experiences. And it's not just, it's actually a very frequent occurrence for people to have encounters in Northern California. The majority of the population lives in very, very rural areas. So to get from one place to the next, um, it's not like parts of New England where it's just one town into the next. You can see everything. Where I grew up, there's a town and then lots of farmland and then another town. So to get from point A to point B, you're going through lots of backwoods and lots of farmland. So it ends up being a, a little different. We have grizzly bears, which is why the building that you see in the lower right-hand corner, uh, that's to keep grizzly bears out. Typically, the men would keep their belongings in there. But if there were um, bad weather or you know, things were getting, people were getting attacked, like there because there were lots of tribal warfare up there, too, they would hide in there, and they would be able to um, not worry so much. So um, the big thing that... Uh, they would do was salmon fishing um, on the Klamath River. Um, for those of you who like going, in, going boating in rapids, it's a class five river. I, as a kid, would go down it with duct tape around my glasses and an inner tube. <laughs> so <laughs> how times have changed. <laughs> um, but it was, they're fishing with nets, and they go out in the rivers, and the, um, they also go out to where the, what the jetty is, which is essentially um, where the a lot of large rocks are where the sand is. If you ever seen Goonies, that's the best way to describe it. Along the beach, you see all these large rocks. That's how it looks. So a little bit about um, the Oma. Um, among the tribes of the Trinity River is a legend of the Oma. The Oma were giants and the leader of the pre-human race. The Oma was expelled from the country it inhabited near the mouth of the Klamath River for disobeying and offending the Creator. And a curse was pronounced upon him, for not even his descendants could return to the land. So the, the hoopa, which is also, um, oh, I got the two confused, I apologize. Um, I'll show you hoopa in a second. These are the Yurok <laughs> with the Oma. It's, um, they live within, they're right next to each other, the hoopa and the Yurok. One slightly further inland, which is the hoopa. They still have a reservation there. And the Hoopa Reservation is right next to where the Patterson-Gimlin film was done. For those of you who don't know what that is, uh, you might have heard of it because it's when you've seen um, a picture of Bigfoot kind of like walking in this grainy 1964 uh, video, and you see it turning and looking and then kind of hurrying off. That's, that's where that was filmed. For the Yurok, the Oma, in the old days when women learned never to leave their acorn meal unattended. 
They would spend all day pounding on these acorns near the big rocks to make acorn meal and they would take it down to the beach and leach it because there's actually an acid in there that makes it so you can't eat it. They would leave it in the sun to dry. When they would come back, it'd be gone. The women would find big footprints in the sand where they left the meal and they knew the giants had taken it. The giant likes Indian food and knows to wait until the acorn is leached to take the bitterness out of it. They believe that they liked the sound of women pounding the acorn and knew it was time to come get the food. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Shall call. Shall call. I don't know. To me, it looks like they have the similar stories about when they would leave the um, salmon out to dry over the smoke huts. They would come out and they would find it missing. So uh, when I talked to some of the my friends, not elders, I don't know any of the elders, but when I talked to some of my friends, they said that that's usually why they actually stay there and camp overnight so they know that no one's going to come take their stuff. Oh, there's the hoopah here. Like I said, it's a very similar setup with the net and the way they fished. Um, the, um, I'm also president of the South Hadley Historical Society, so I know all this really random stuff. The um, three, when you go across what's called the lower bridge in South Hadley, there's actually three long strips of essentially looks like sandbar, with ro but it's a little bit of rocks. Um, those are, those are man-made. Those were made by the local natives there in South Hadley prior to 1620s. And that's actually, it was made so well, they actually have the bridge on top of them. But that's what they would use to create nets to catch all of the um, shad run to catch their fish. So, so they would do the berries with wooden stakes. Um, I actually have at home, which I didn't bring with me, um, a similar hat. Um, their weaving was so tight that it was prized in the area because they would, you'd be able to keep water in it and you'd be able to actually cook in them too. So just a look at that. So some of the historical counters I want to talk about because some of these are from personal um, are from personal journals. Some of them are going to be from newspaper clippings. The only problem with some of the newspaper clippings is some of them were actually on um, April 1st. <laughs> so you have to take, I take them with a grain of salt, but some of them ring true. Do you know what I mean? So when you read something, you go, there's, there's some truth to that. So I, that's why I wanted to share with you some of this. So the first one that I have found um, and did some research on was um, Samuel Champlain when he was on the St. Lawrence River in 1603. He was a French explorer, um, and he was going there to specifically look for trade routes for fur. In his book, De Savages, don't ask me to speak French, that's a word I cannot do, uh, written in his first voyage, he talked about the, the Gugu of the Micmac tribe, and he actually met someone from the Gugu tribe. Um, he's, it was supposed to be a hideous woman who was taller than a ship and carries a hunting pouch to put her human victims in so she can eat them later. The Gugu is described to have big hands and hairy faces like a bear, but the face is flat with no snout and no visible ears, which you will hear people talk about Bigfoot similarly. They're supposed to whistle shrilly and live around parts of Quebec and New Brunswick. So maybe they're the precursors to the French Canadians that came down. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm teasing you. So that's one of the first, um, one of the first uh, encounters. Mm -hmm. Next one is Captain John Smith in the Susquehanna tribe in 1694. He wrote a book called The History of Virginia, and he specifically talks about the anas Anastes. The subject, um, they were giant in proportion to the English. Their left, they said they measured their calf, and it was one yard around. Wow. Just one yard around. <laughs> Um, the rest of the limbs were comparable and proportional. Um, but he was the goodliest man he ever behold. He was kind, he was generous, but he didn't understand him. Uh, the tribe were in a series of wars with the Iroquois League and their population and identity, identity disappeared. And it was believed that the rest of the tribe um, merged with the surrounding area. Um, this one I thought was interesting, Northern Vermont um, in 1759. 
of the French and Indian War. Um, there was along the disputed border, uh, Major Robert Rogers encountered a bear and threw, that threw objects at him, and the natives of Vermont called it Slippery Skin, which I thought was an interesting name. Next one I want to talk about is Governor Jonas Gulasha, I think it's pronounced, from 1813. And um, I wasn't able to find a documented counter, um, but however, because of his encounter with his re-election campaign, he specifically said he was going to rid the state of slippery skin. And that was actually part of his motto, his campaign motto. And he wanted to personally shoot the creature. So when the creature was sighted in Maidstone in northern Vermont on the Canadian border, he traveled to the township with a hunting party. And the accounts state that he rubbed female bear scent all over his body and clothes to try to lure the creature out of the woods. I think they might have tried that on Finding Bigfoot at some point. Um, unfortunately, he was unsuccessful in luring the creature out of the woods and shooting the creature, and, in, and also in being reelected. <laughs> so that's his, his book. In the Boston Daily Times in 1839, Robert Lincoln, he was an agent for Western New York um, Lumber Company. And um, that's the other thing that uh, I wanted to mention. I grew up in a town of, called Scotia, and that was a lumber town. Um, it was a town of 1,000 people, and it was specifically owned by the Pacific Lumber Company at the time. It's now defunct. It's no longer a town where uh, to live there, you have to work there. Uh, the Pacific Lumber Company is no longer in existence because it was bought out by a guy from Texas because it had too much free cash. And that's when you start hearing about clear cutting of redwood trees in the mid-'90s. The population that lived there was upset because we wanted jobs in 20 years but the guy, quote unquote, he who has the gold wins. So you can figure out how I feel about that. Um, but the Boston Daily Times, he, was, he, was a lumber, uh, he owned a lumber company. He traveled to this timber camp in western New York because two employees saw a huge monster in the form of a man, but he was taller and stouter, and he covered in long hair and was frightening looking. The hunting party of 21 people were gathered and included some native men. The natives told Lincoln the creature was powerful but harmless and just wanted to see what, it was, what they were doing. So, but they didn't listen to them and they said, okay, we'll track it for you. So when the creature found Lincoln, he took out his spyglass and he viewed the creature. He said it appeared between eight to nine feet tall, very athletic, and more like a beast standing erect than a man. The beast was captured and it howled for hours on end and did not accept food or drink for three days. When the creature did eventually eat, it became quiet and sullen ever since. So it became resigned. Lincoln noted that the creature was exhibited in New York, but there's no mention of what happened to the creature after the expedition. And there is talk of a couple of different Bigfoots at different points in history being caught, but nothing knows what happens after a certain expedition happened. Um, one of my favorite stories is actually from The Wilderness Hunter, and it's a it's a story that Theodore Roosevelt heard secondhand. And it's kind of creepy, but it's fun. So this is about 1880s that he heard it, um, but he put it in his book, which was published in 1893 specifically. So Roosevelt shared a story about a fur trapper called Bowman. At the time, he was traveling with a partner. This event occurred when Bowman was a young man traveling with a partner what is now Wyoming, Montana border. These trappers were interested in a pass that there was supposed to be many beaver, but there was an e had an evil reputation. The rumor was that a solitary trapper was slain by a wild beast and was half eaten. The remains were found by some mining prospectors that had met him the previous night and at that point was still very much alive. The story goes that these two hunters, including Bowman, set up camp and left to set up their beaver traps for the day. When they returned to camp, something had rummaged around in their camp and uh, scattered things about like a bear would. So they found the footprints and noted that it looked like a bear, which you will hear people talk about finding Bigfoot tracks and they have to determine if it's like a bear or not. Because if, if you see a bear step, it'll sometimes step into its own footprint, creating a longer footprint. Um, so the bear, but the thing that was strange to them, it looked like the bear was walking around on two legs. 
They laughed about it and went to sleep. The men woke up in the middle of the night to a wild beast odor and Bowman caught the silhouette of a great body out in the darkness. He shot at the threatening shadow and he must have missed because the shadow went smashing back into the woods. So they stayed up all night with a fire as big as they could get it blaring because they were scared. Uh, let's see here. They decided because they were scared they were going to leave the next day. But they first had to go to check their traps. So the next morning they went and they started to collect their traps and they went together because they were scared. But because of how, you know how when you're scared in the middle of the night, in the beginning of the day, I don't know why I was so scared. That, that must have been ridiculous. So they decided to split up because it would cut their time in half. One would go look at the traps, who was Bowman, who went and looked at the traps, and this other guy went back to camp to collect everything together and get ready to go. Bowman found three beavers in one of the traps, so it took him several hours to prepare the pelts. When he finally returned to camp, he shouted for his friend, but there was no answer. The fire had gone out and there was just a little thin line of smoke curling from the fire. Bowman found his friend. His body was splayed out. His friend's body was still warm, but there were four large fang marks in his neck. The tracks of the man and the beast told the story. His friend had sat down on a log with his back to the forest, facing the fire to keep warm. He was snuck up upon and killed. Bowman, utterly unnerved and believing the creature to be half man and half devil, abandoned everything but his rifle and snuck off as fast, excuse me, struck off as fast as he could down the pass, not halting until he meets the meadows beyond the forest and he kept going all night until he felt he was beyond the reach of pursuit. So I love that story, but it's creepy as heck. <laughs> um, there's one encounter here in, in Webster, Mass, that I thought was interesting. Um, it, this was in the Boston Daily Newspaper, but this was actually July 16th. And it's believed that, um, let's see, for political, social, and business circles were stirred up yesterday by a report of a wild man seen in a berry pasture on Orchard Road. It is becoming established that the wild man will show up year after year to go to this berry pasture. But it frightened Miss Paul Lampshire and their children who happened to be berry picking and saw the, saw the creature. It guess it startled them by yelling a whoop. The family was now terrified and ran as they, fast as they could to town. But the group of men who went looking for the wild men could not find it. So those are some of the historical newspaper clippings that I thought were pretty interesting, at least for most of the area around here. So to talk a little bit about what I encountered growing up, um, this is the Eel River. Um, Northern California, where you would go swimming and fishing, looks a lot like this. There's a nice ridge line up top that you can see that you can walk around and you get these beautiful views. Um, some of the times you'll have sheer cliffs that you can walk up near um, and you, if you sit down you can just sit and watch and sometimes you'll see black bears go by, deer in the valley, sheep. It's pretty cool to just sit and watch. I've been there, it's beautiful. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> it is. Uh, like, I, like it's a personal thing. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I did it. Um, <laughs> where I'm from is 250 miles north of San Francisco. Um, this is kind of gets you to me much younger, um, but this is the town of Scotia I was telling you about, which is the lumber town, and this is the town of Riedel, which essentially was the place the, the lumbermen went and hung out once they got paid. <laughs> and there was a lot of prostitution, a lot of saloons, and it was almost like the bedroom community for Scotia. Um, <laughs> but um, that was up until... <laughs> the 60s and then it kind of changed. Um, but my family had, for at least on my mother's side, they had been there from the founding of the town. So um, my grandfather was the barber. It was one of those town of a thousand people. You knew everyone. Everyone knew you. Uh, the library that I went to growing up was the size of this room. So, but I went there every day after school because that was my thing. So my first encounter and these are some pictures of my family and me in the area, just so you can kind of get an idea of what it looked like. See how you can't see essentially beyond 
the front of the woods. Mm -hmm. It's all like that. So if there's something back there, you can't see it. Um, my grandparents, when they would come out with us, uh, they, they were hearing, so there would be lots of uh, talking, just normal talking and whatnot. But it was just my parents. Um, we would play at the river. The deepest the river got was maybe a foot and a half. So it wasn't a river as we think of as a river, it was more of a creek. Um, and there was a lot of like minnows and just smaller fish that you could go hunt, fishing for. So while we pretended to swim, i.e. dragging ourselves along the bottom of the water with our hands, uh, my parents would usually fish. One of the things me and my sister liked to do, I'm the eldest of four, but the only other person who would have been there would have been my first sister, uh, Bernadette. We would clack rocks together. It was something we enjoyed doing, which as we found out later in life, that apparently that's a noise that's familiar to Bigfoot. Just the sound of children was also something that is encountered and heard by people when they think of Bigfoot and they encounter Bigfoot, as opposed to a sound of adults. So I think those sounds initially is what drew this particular Bigfoot in. Um, Kings Range National Conservation Area is right next to Edersburg. And it's, um, there's a couple more pictures here. There's me as a little, little person. Um, but it's just a vast remote area that no one really ever goes to. It's literally dirt roads to get out there. So it's mostly for hikers, hunters, and campers. And it's far and few in between, especially now because the majority of it's actually uh, most likely been taken over by um, Mexican kingpins for marijuana because that's a well-known area for marijuana in Northern California. It's part of what's called the Emerald Triangle. So if you know anything about the Emerald Triangle, you know what I'm talking about. My encounter happened at night. We had all gone to sleep. We were in the tent. You know the old Green Army tents where you could put the flaps up but still had the netting down? I was on a cot. I know everyone was in there. And I had happened to roll over and I saw something squatting next to the died down fire. What was squatting next to the died down fire, I was kind of looking at it and it was, had a stick and it was poking at the fire. And I could see its face and I could see in front of it. It looked like a human except really furry. And I remember not being afraid because I'd seen bears, I'd seen cats, etc. But it wasn't something that scared me. So I literally rolled over and went back to sleep. <laughs> Uh, there was a 1994 earthquake that was 7.2. I did the same thing. So that'll give you kind of my idea what I'm like. Maybe I need to be more scared, but I'm not. <laughs> um, but anyway, so I rolled over and went back to sleep. The next morning, my parents were signing, what's with the big feet? Why are we seeing these big footprints around the campfire area? And they kept saying, bear no toes. That was like the sign, essentially. And I thought that was, so I'm like, OK, so I did see something last night. But I did, couldn't figure out what it was. And it wasn't until I got older that I heard this term Bigfoot. And to me, it sounded correct. OK? So I didn't have a word for it when I was five. So as I got older, I ended up going to, like I said, Wheaton College for anthropology, trying to figure out what the heck I saw, I got interested in um, evolution, et cetera. Um, my other degree in history was in American history and European history. My minors, women's studies, Greek and Latin. I'm a big dork. I just like figuring out everything so I can answer that why question. Obviously, I'm into the why question. So just a little bit more about Edersburg. Here's Kings Mountain Range down in here. This is Highway 101, which is a two-lane highway going into Northern California. So this is sparse as it is. Um, and you'll, but anyway, you'll find that the majority of, if you, when you're looking at this, you'll see the majority of the county is either federal or state parks. And they're not one or two. They're a couple thousands upon thousands of miles. So my second encounter was in February 2010. I had flown out there um, and couldn't take a flight up to Eureka, which is what you try to do, um, because there was too much fog. So I had to rent a car. And it's always that 
gambling toss flying out there because either you're going to be in Northern California in 12 hours from, from um, Hartford or you're going to end up uh, driving for another five and a half hours at the end of that 12 hour flight. <laughs> so I had to drive <laughs> and um, so in turn I had to drive back because it's actually cheaper for you to take a car to Humboldt County and drive back than it is for you to try to leave it there because they're like it's too remote you can't just leave the car there. So anyway so I'm driving down it's about one between one and two in the morning and I see something squatting. I don't know why Bigfoot's always squatting when I see him, but he seems to do that. And I say he in, in quotes because neither one that I saw had mammary glands. Um, <laughs> so I'm assuming it's a he. Uh, squatting on the side of the road and it sees me. And it sees me stop and I'm staring at it. It's staring at me. And the only thing I could think of in the back of my mind was, don't show teeth. <laughs> I waved at a Bigfoot. That was my only thought. <laughs> So I'm waving at this thing and I'm thinking to myself, get out of the car, get out of the car, get out of the car, get out of the car. You want to meet this thing. You want to meet this thing. Get out of the car. My second thought is you have to catch a plane, Des. You have three hours to catch a plane. You got to get to San Francisco. So I'm debating with myself and this thing's looking at me and looking further down the road. I'm like, what is he looking at? Looking at me further down the road. So I'm like, I got to catch the plane because I'm not made of money. So I end up going, I end up, bye, you know, I waved. I don't know why I'm thinking waving's working because this is a cultural thing. <laughs> it's looking at me like I'm nuts. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, but I figured it was some interaction. It was something to show that I was okay. Um, I think it saw I was female from the light of the car because I don't dress for anyone but myself at two in the morning. So I had kind of lower cut shirt and was just trying to be comfortable. So I think it could tell it was female. Um, so I took off down the road and about 30 yards down in the slight ravine, you can just see it down in here. So Bigfoot was slightly in front of this, like over here. There was deer down in here when I turned and looked. So it was a hungry Bigfoot. So it's a good thing I didn't get out of the car. <laughs> that was my first thought. And then my second thought was, oh, so I'm driving down. I finally get to Leggett, which uh, happens to have an, one of the few all night um, gas stations and I went into the little bathroom and it's one of those creepy bathrooms that has a light that kind of flickers and I'm staring at myself in the wind in the mirror that's slightly warped going I just saw what I thought I saw I know I just saw what I thought I saw when I was five. Oh my god oh my god oh my god I can't tell the guy at the front desk he'll think I'm nuts so <laughs> that was my whole thought process so I'm on a plane headed back to a Hartford going, I can't wait to tell my husband. I can't wait to tell my husband. Why wasn't he there? Damn it. Because he thinks I'm, he doesn't believe me. He thinks I'm insane. But it's exciting for me to say and show what, it was solidifying for me to say, okay, I know what I saw when I was five years old. And I can say, I know this thing exists. It's not a bear. It's not a mountain lion or a cougar that I saw. It was a Bigfoot. Okay. So these are some of the books that I have picked up over time that I have found very useful in some of my readings. There's also another one called um, New England, let's see, Sasquatch or Bigfoot in New York. And it's a state one, a state book. And I found them interesting. So hopefully this has been interesting to you and uh, has given you a little bit of a bigger perspective about the history of Bigfoot and uh, it's not just a modern phenomena. It's something that's been going on for a long time. Thank you very much.